Welcome to our CGSR research roundtable um, for the week. Uh, I'm Benjamin Bainey. I am a senior fellow uh, here at uh, the Center for Global Security Research. Um, I am very pleased to be hosting uh, today's research roundtable with uh, two scholars uh, um, who are very well known in their field and who in the last couple of years actually both of these books came out um, right in the middle of, of uh, the COVID lockdown. Um, but both, uh, both of these scholars have come out with books that have really uh, re-energized the conversation uh, in the academic community and in the policy community about uh, competition under the nuclear shadow, uh, arms control, uh, and deterrence. And so it is a great pleasure for me to uh, welcome uh, Daryl Press and Brennan Green uh, to talk about their books today as a part of this research roundtable. Um, so let me let me briefly introduce our guests. I'm just going to read their bios. Uh, so bear with me. <clears throat> so Daryl Press is professor in the Department of Government at Dartmouth College. Uh, along with Kier Lieber, Daryl is the author of Myth of the Nuclear Revolution, Power Politics in the Atomic Age. I'm going to Hold up my copy of Daryl's book here. It's also got great cover art. It's a little blurry. Oh, you can see Brendan's better. Cover art is fantastic. The book is fantastic. Um, second, uh, Brendan Green is Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Cincinnati. <clears throat> and Brendan is author of The Revolution That Failed, Nuclear Competition, Arms Control, and the Cold War. Uh, and there's my copy of Brendan's book. Um, so what I'm going to do is just give some introductory remarks. Uh, I really want to give both Brendan and Daryl uh, about 20 minutes of time to talk about the findings of their books uh, as they relate to, um, you know, really the theories of deterrence and competition um, under the nuclear shadow. And at the end, we will open it up for Q&A. So write your questions down, put up your hands if you would. Um, you can also throw questions into the chat, but we'd really prefer to get verbal uh, questions uh, from from live live humans. <clears throat> so, just to kick things off, you know, I think really fundamentally these two books are both about um, kind of how deterrence works in the minds of uh, of policymakers and what are the logics of deterrence and competition um, under under the nuclear shadow, and really how that relates to core decisions that that um, that can be made in, in arms control as well. Um, both of these books, I think, critically evaluate uh, the empirical evidence relating to the theories of, of nuclear competition and nuclear deterrence. Uh, and Brendan is going to outline uh, what those theories are um, out in, uh, particularly out in the academic community. And fundamentally, these books really speak to the challenges and the decisions um, that we're making here at Livermore right now and the decisions that we're trying to inform by national leadership um, in both the future of nuclear deterrence mission focus area um, that our director Kim Budil has, has set us forth on and the integrated deterrence and technical competition mission focus area, which is trying to ask the broader question of, you know, what is competition uh, in this new era uh, that we're entering into? Um, ultimately, you know, really our understanding of deterrence is usually related back to this concept of mutually assured destruction uh, or MAD um, and the canonical uh, idea of a, a chicken game of two cars driving at each other and waiting for the lesser resolved one to swerve. Um, but these books really question whether that model is complete, um, whether it applies in all cases, and whether it really captures all the dynamics of competition under the nuclear shadow. So I'm really, really pleased to, to, um, to be introducing our guests. It's great when you find work that is really engaging and, and thoughtful, and it's particularly gratifying when it's, you know, done by co great colleagues that uh, you admire, respect, and, and like working with. So it's great to have you guys. Brendan, we'll kick off uh, with you. So Brendan, over to you. Okay, terrific. Thanks so much, Ben. Um, I really appreciate you having me on to talk about my book. I always love talking at Livermore, uh, where I always learn a lot. Uh, so I'm looking forward to everyone's questions. Uh, I'll try to keep it relatively short. Um, 
So uh, what I'm going to talk to you today about is about my book. Uh, and it's a, and the book is basically about uh, the theory of mutually assured destruction uh, and the puzzle that is posed for this theory by the late Cold War nuclear arms race. Um, so the puzzle of the book's simple. Uh, and in a sentence, it would be, why keep investing in nuclear weapons uh, after you and your adversary can blow up the world many times over? Uh, and so that's sort of the intuitive form uh, of a puzzle that comes out of our best uh, regarded and, and most popular theory uh, of how nuclear weapons affect international politics, uh, which uh, is often called the theory of mutually assured destruction or also known as the theory of the nuclear revolution. I'm just going to call it MAD. Uh, and so briefly, uh, what MAD says is that one side each has uh, a secure second strike arsenal, that is an arsenal where uh, it's still possible to deliver a devastating response even after the other side has attacked you first. Uh, once both sides have this kind of arsenal, it's no longer possible for anyone to win a nuclear war. Uh, and that fact, Matt, Ar Matt argues, transforms international politics. Um, and in particular, of importance for my book, once this threshold is reached, Matt argues, the nuclear balance uh, between adversaries becomes stalemated. That is, it's no longer possible to be stronger than the other side. Um, and that, that means that you can't benefit from any more weapons or any other additional increments of, of military power. Uh, the politics is no longer driven by military forces anymore. Uh, and so that makes arms races in, in stalemate uh, kind of pointless. Uh, they're basically just giant money bonfires. Uh, maybe the kind of thing uh, that seems like a good hobby for your adversary, uh, but not something uh, that you would necessarily be interested in doing yourself. Um, and so uh, the, the trouble that uh, this uh, is posed for MAD and its theory of arms races is that it was almost directly after the Soviet Union finally uh, obtained secure second strike capabilities in the, the mid to late 1960s that a giant arms race kicked off between the superpowers. Uh, and it featured all of the things that are not supposed to happen uh, if military, if nuclear stalemate has stabilized the world. Uh, so both sides invested uh, in modernization of their nuclear forces, but not just for purposes of survivability, but purposes of counterforce, uh, attacking the other side's nuclear weapons. Um, which is supposed to be insane and not something that you should do if they have a secure second strike. Um, both sides invested in defenses, both uh, briefly and episodically in uh, missile defenses, but also in civil defenses. Um, the, each side crafted increasingly Byzantine and Baroque nuclear doctrines about how they were going to fight a global, protracted, integrated nuclear conventional war. Um, and at the same time, as all this was going on, uh, the major focus of diplomacy uh, was on arms control. Uh, and I think that this focus into which, you know, thousands and thousands of man hours were spent, um, you know, ultimately ended up historically looking a little bit like uh, it was the Seinfeld of international politics. Uh, that is a wildly popular show about nothing. Um, and so why did all of this happen? Um, and I'll just say briefly, MAD sort of has an answer, right? Uh, the answer is that domestic politics made us do it. Uh, so military industrial complexes, uh, iron triangles, Congress run amok, um, electoral politics, that sort of thing kind of forced statesmen into an arms race that they, that they knew was not a good idea and that they didn't really want, but that they had to do for basically domestic political reasons, right? Um, you know, so... Uh, what does my book have to say about this puzzle? Um, well, I basically propose a, a different theory to explain the arms race. Um, and following a, a famous article by Alfred Woolstetter, I call that theory the theory of the delicate nuclear balance. Um, and so the key thing to understand here is that MAD's key assumption is that nuclear stalemate is permanent, more or less, right? Which is that once you've uh, achieved a force that's really secure against attack, um, that has, you know, some sizable number of weapons in it, uh, then th there's nothing more you can do to improve your position. Um, because for that to change, for the nuclear balance to become unstalemated, uh, you would have to, to suffer large and simultaneous sh uh, different shocks 
uh, from technology at the same time. Um, and moreover, you would have to overcome the fact that retaliation is cheaper than counterforce, uh, right? Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's according to Matt, it's always easier to ha add another warhead, right, than it is to stop a warhead from coming in or to destroy one, right? So uh, there should be uh, competitive efficiencies on the side of staying in sal stalemate. Um, and, and furthermore, if, if that's not enough, then you can use arms control to sort of manage your domestic problems uh, and save money, right? Uh, and so these are the core reasons why Matt assumes that basically stalemate is going to last forever once you get there. Um, and so I would argue that that's not the case uh, and that the nuclear balance can be both technically and perceptually delicate, right? Prone to quick and dramatic and perhaps dangerous changes. And so I'm going to focus today on sort of the technical de delicacy of the balance, but there's also an interesting story during the Cold War arms race about how each side was perceiving the other. Um, but anyway, uh, Wolstetter and others uh, have observed that basically uh, the, the, the ability to retaliate, um, as well as the ability to go after uh, the other side's nuclear weapons, depends on a series of different kind of technical hurdles that you have to clear. Uh, and so secure second strike arsenals are all composed um, on the assumption that you can clear the different technical hurdles. Um, but the technology changes, uh, right? And that that changing technology can change the character of the nuclear balance uh, and make it uh, more or less malleable at different points in time. Um, so I think if you look at sort of the classic story about the Cold War nuclear balance, this was a balance that was, uh, you know, based on the triad, right? Uh, you know, a, a nuclear response in the United States, from the United States at least, um, you know, based on both long range nuclear bombers uh, that would penetrate Soviet airspace, uh, nuclear ballistic missile submarines um, that would launch weapons uh, from hidden spots in the world's oceans, uh, and ICBMs. Uh, launched uh, transcontinentally across the poles um, from uh, secure bases in the continental United States, right? So those were, the, were sort of the three cornerstones of, of American retaliatory uh, capability at second strike capability. Um, furthermore, uh, you know, the, those depended on command and control capabilities uh, and potentially on defenses of one kind or another, air, missile, civil defenses, that sort of thing. Um, and if you look carefully at each of these categories, uh, I think the record shows that technology was fluctuating quite highly um, in each of them at different points in the Cold War. Um, so for instance, uh, you know, on about the middle of the Cold War, uh, when the Soviets uh, sort of uh, advanced in nuclear submarines, uh, American bombers suddenly became much more vulnerable or potentially vulnerable than they had been before on the idea that uh, sort of nuclear uh, Soviet submarines could swim up close to the United States and launch weapons at depressed trajectories that would quickly hit bomber bases before bombers could escape. Uh, similarly, air defense capabilities were changing and we were moving from a world where air defenses were not so hard to penetrate to kind of the world that we see today where they're incredibly difficult to penetrate. Um, you know, you had uh, very famously uh, increasing missile accuracy uh, was eroding the survivability of land-based ICBMs, um, which I feel confident Daryl will tell you something about. Um, you know, and, and even in, in the realm of, of uh, you know, nuclear submarines, uh, you know, widely and correctly considered the most secure of, of retaliatory forces, um, there were big changes, especially on the Soviet side. The United States had, uh, at, at different periods of time, uh, very exceptional anti-submarine warfare capabilities and uh, could threaten, uh, sometimes more credibly than others, uh, to go after Soviet nuclear submarines before they had fired uh, their weapons. Um, so the point of all of this is, is, is just to say uh, there were lots of these little, big, different kinds of technological changes that swung back and forth during the Cold War, uh, and that made the nuclear balance look different at different times, even if stalemate still persisted. Um, and why this matters is that that gives states incentives to arms race, even if they're in nuclear stalemate. Um, the, the possibility that small technical changes could produce dramatic uncertainties meant that you had to be prepared. Um, it made it possible that different kinds of counterforce would be more cost-effective than survivability. Um, and the balance was also asymmetric, which is that the US was sort of technically more competent and richer than the Soviet Union. 
Um, and so uh, it could afford to exploit balances that were shifting in its direction, areas of the balance that were, um, and could also afford a certain amount of inefficient competition if that's what it came down to. Um, and so why would you want to do that if that's how the nuclear balance actually works? Well, it would, it would potentially give you certain benefits. Um, there are sort of obvious benefits uh, in terms of um, crisis bargaining, right? So if, if, you, could, if you could escape stalemate uh, and, a, and a major crisis happened, that would, that would give you the upper hand in that test of nerves. You would have reason to say that you could hang in longer uh, in a crisis uh, and push a more aggressive policy and that your opponent uh, who, who was in a position to suffer more than you uh, would, would be more interested in backing down than testing that, right? Um, but even beyond that, I think, um, even if you never were able to escape stalemate, uh, arms racing could potentially give a state different peacetime benefits that were very valuable to it, um, right? So it could increase general deterrence um, by increasing the uncertainty of the balance, you could make your adversary sort of less likely to select into crises. Um, you could divert your adversary's defense resources uh, into inefficient areas of competition for them. Um, and you could uh, even potentially, if, if, those, if that competition was going well in your favor, uh, force your adversary to diplomatically adjust their policy uh, in order to compensate. Uh, either sort of striking some lopsided arms control deal or stopping competition in some area that you didn't like so that it could focus on where the pressure was, something like that. Um, and then finally, and importantly, uh, I think for the U.S. in particular, uh, nuclear competition also gave it a way to manage its alliances uh, and to deal with the vexed and basically unsolvable problem of extended nuclear deterrence um, because competition uh, sort of to, to potentially escape stalemate is something that can give your allies confidence, right? Whereas accepting stalemate and sort of saying that, uh, you know, at the moment of crisis, uh, everything is going to turn on this big ambiguity about whether we're really willing to die for you, um, you know, is, is, much, is much less, um, you know, causes centrifugal forces, I should say, in alliances, sort of spinning them out right, and, and encouraging neutralism uh, and independence, both in peacetime, but certainly as the moment of crisis approaches, right? And so comp nuclear competition could help with that, right? So that's my basic story, right, uh, is I have a story about why contra-mad, uh, the nuclear balance is actually quite delicate, um, both perceptually, but particularly technically, right? And that technical delicacy uh, gives you incentives to arms race, um, you know, perhaps to escape uh, nuclear stalemate, but certainly, uh, uh, to reap the benefits of peacetime uh, efforts to change the nuclear balance, even if stalemate has never escaped. Um, so uh, uh, I'll just, I want to spend at least a little bit of time sort of telling you what I found in, in the history of the Cold War arms race. Um, and uh, you, you won't be surprised uh, to find that I think it supports my argument. Um, but uh, basically what I did was I went and I looked through about 20 or 30,000 diplomatic documents uh, from the period of 1969 uh, to about 1980, right? So basically the, the part of the, of the nuclear arms race in the late Cold War where all of the big programs that we heard about in the 1980s sort of got started and approved um, and prosecuted. Uh, and you know, when I went over these documents, um, there were several important things that I didn't find, right? So nobody thought, that the United States had escaped mutually assured destruction, right? Um, everybody emphatically believed that uh, they were still in a state of mutually insured destruction and that, you know, an all out nuclear war would be an utter disaster and that there were no reasons to try to court them. So nothing at all like that happened. Um, and I should also add that, you know, at least, you know, uh, in, in the documents that I was able to find, it, it was very rare for people to stand up and say, you know, I think it would be a really good idea to pursue counterforce so that we can credibly threaten a first strike against the Soviet Union during a crisis, right? Um, I sort of did once find uh, Paul Nitsa saying something very similar to that. Uh, you know, it, it, for those of you who know the history, right, Paul Nitsa was a very hawkish uh, kind of guy on nuclear issues and also famous for these uh, kind of crazy nuclear arguments about the balance. Um, but in between making these crazy arguments, he one time, it appears to me, did sort of stand up and say that he thought, you know, getting a, a first strike capability would be a good idea. Um, but but that was pretty rare, right? And, and I think 
you know, th th that's part because, you know, uh, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, anyone really wants to contemplate that. But uh, more than that, it, it was a very taboo thing to say, right? This is the kind of thing that loses you a fight very quickly um, by, viola by violating um, basically norms of discussion and debate. Um, what I did find uh, was that there was just tremendous uncertainty about the state of the future nuclear balance um, rather than the kind of confidence that MAD predicts about the world. Um, so the, the Nixon administration, for instance, was deeply worried about bomber vulnerability early in their first term. And in fact, they would sort of try to make these adjustments, right, to disperse the bombers, right, and they would do the studies and it would come back that it's still not looking that good. Uh, and that, you know, if the Soviets continue with, with building these and sending these uh, Yankee uh, SSBNs forward, right, we could be in real trouble, especially as their air defenses, um, you know, uh, improve. Um, that diminished over time, right, as they figured out that the Soviet policy was not going to be what they thought it was. Um, but it, 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 I think it really a good example of showing just how stuff that we take for granted was not taken for granted by the people who were worrying about it. Um, they were constantly... Uh, also thinking about general technological change. Uh, all of the presidents from Nixon to Carter are often harping on the importance of being on the technological cutting edge um, and connecting that to defense programs. Uh, you know, for instance, AVMs under Nixon uh, or uh, other aspects of submarine warfare under Carter, right? Um, and so there was just this tremendous technical uncertainty about the balance that comes through. Um, I do think you see uh, a number of examples uh, of anticipating potential crisis benefits, um, you know, at least in terms of keeping the Soviet Union from escaping mad, um, and in some cases in terms of, of uh, the United States' ability uh, to escape mad itself. Um, so one of the quotes in my book here is from uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, the National Security Advisor to Carter, and he's, he's uh, in a meeting sort of debating what nuclear capabilities to buy Right, And he says that our requirements for command and control and civil defense can only be understood uh, if we discussed the roles they would play in crisis bargaining scenarios. Uh, he was afraid that the US will be able at best to wage a war of spasmodic apocalypse rather than one controlled for political purposes. Right, So he's talking here about how it's important for the United States to be able to have the command and control, not just, I would say, to survive a Soviet first strike, but to go after Soviet capabilities uh, it, it itself in some kind of future war. Um, similarly, uh, I think you see lots and lots of evidence that there were just tremendous peacetime benefits to be reaped from counterforce investments. Right, So uh, you know, the Nixon and Ford administrations would just harp uh, on the effect these kinds of investments could have on America's allies, right? Um, so, uh, you know, uh, Nixon uh, early in his administration basically says that the, the central military problem the United States faces is that with the advent of a Soviet secure second strike force, uh, that the U.S. bargaining position has shifted. Uh, the nuclear umbrella is no longer there, Nixon said. We must face the facts. Um, at the same time, he later says when discussing missile defense, I think um, that we have to we have to have we want a defense policy, which makes it possible for us to have a foreign policy. We need the confidence of others. Uh, we need our allies to believe that we're going to be able to stand up for them, in other words. Right. Um, similarly, uh, you know, uh, this this applied to sort of offensive first strike assets as well. Right. Uh, Nixon basically says that military policy in one meeting sort of in the later 1970s uh, says that it all comes down to diplomacy, as we know, and first strike and counterforce can be an asset uh, in that case. Uh, however, he quickly cautions that we shouldn't tell the whole truth uh, about the meaning of such programs uh, when we go about defending them publicly. Uh, similarly, a senior State Department official in these debates said that our commitments to our allies would seem more credible if we had an enhanced counterforce capability and noting that this view is gaining currency in Europe, right? So I think we see sort of time and time again in the documents that uh, even if you can't escape stalemate, all of these administrations thought that there were benefits to be reaped. Um, and so uh, I'm sort of uh, at the running out of time here. Uh, so I'll just, I'll, I'll stop the chasing of quotes. Um, but let me conclude by saying that, um, you know, there are basically two other big takeaway points, uh, which is that one, uh, the purpose of arms control and all of this was basically 
uh, to make your force posture more competitive. Uh, it, it was one of these diversionary purposes to, to strike deals that sort of first forced uh, the competition towards things the United States was good at, right? Like uh, technological investment, accuracy, uh, those sort of things, and away from things it was bad at, uh, large cash investments and pumping out large numbers of missiles, right? Um, and you can see that this just utterly animated uh, a lot of U.S. arms control policy during this period. Um, and that finally, when you sort of dig for MAD's counter explanation, these domestic forces uh, gone awry, you, you discover at, at best a very ambiguous picture, right? Which is that there were large portions of the military industrial complex that were not interested uh, in a counter force race. Um, and similarly, there, there were huge sort of dovish chunks of Congress at this time um, that made it very difficult uh, to get one, right? And so that when you look at domestic forces, there were, you know, perhaps a couple that pushed here and there, I think, uh, uh, towards a more competitive policy, but mostly you had these retractive forces that were pushing back against uh, what decision makers wanted to do. Um, so anyway, that's what I found, right? Uh, I think this anomaly of the arms race is basically explained uh, by the fact of the delicacy of the nuclear balance rather than the kind of permanent stalemate that MAD uh, assumes. And I look forward to any questions that you might have about either the theory or the cases. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brendan. Fantastic talk. Uh, Brendan's talk obviously looks really deeply back into the history of the late Cold War. Um, so now I want to hand it over to Daryl, who's going to kind of pick off, pick up where where uh, where Brendan left off, left off, and look more into the contemporary competition. So Daryl, over to you. Thank you, Ben. Um, let me do two things. I'll try to do them pretty briefly. Um, the first is um, Ben asked me to give a quick overview of the book argument that uh, Kier Lieber and I made, and the second thing is to talk directly about the reasons the United States is and should pursue counterforce capabilities. Um, when I get to that second part of my remarks, I'll define what it is I mean by counterforce capabilities. So let me start by just spending about five minutes and giving you a very brief overview of the book argument. And I have to say it's, it's different than Brendan's, but the themes overlap substantially, which is a nice way of saying we find many of the same things. The book argument starts with a puzzle, and the puzzle can be seen when you focus on two facts about the nuclear age. Fact number one is that nuclear weapons appear to be very effective instruments of stalemate. Obviously, there's been no nuclear war since 1945. There hasn't even been a great power war since 1945. And I think there's lots of evidence and very strong theory, both of which suggest that those facts are not coincidences, that the existence of nuclear weapons in large numbers in the hands of the superpower rivals had a powerful pacifying influence on the likelihood of war between them and between other great power rivals since. Okay, so that's fact number one. Nuclear weapons have an extremely strong pacifying effect. Fact number two is that the nuclear age was characterized, has been characterized by intense geopolitical competition. In the pre-nuclear age, before nuclear weapons, countries who feared that their enemies would conquer them or maybe take over large land masses, big pieces of continents, and then consolidate that wealth and mass of power against them, had a playbook, a toolkit, a geopolitical uh, tools that they did in order to protect themselves. They built alliances, they engaged in arms races, and they carefully monitored the economic and military power of their rivals. Those were the geopolitical tools of the pre-nuclear age. Of course, if you look at the nuclear age, it looks almost identical. The Cold War is basically synonymous with alliance building. The Cold War is basically synonymous with arms racing. And the entirety of the Cold War was characterized by both sides, carefully monitoring the economic and military might of their adversary to watch for any worrisome changes in the balance of power. As we all know, that's characterized the post-Cold War as well. As the United States builds alliances, builds military capability, the Chinese counter arms race, and both sides warily watch each other for changes in the balance of power. So the question is this, if nuclear weapons are such powerful instruments of stalemate, which I believe they are, and if they've done such a great job preventing the outbreak of the nastiest kinds of great power war, then why do the big powers still compete so intensely as if that kind of war was just around the corner? The answer 
that Kira and I came up with, which is an answer which I think resonates in many ways with what Brendan just said, is it has to do with three elements or three aspects of the nature of stalemate, the nature of nuclear stalemate. And once you recognize those three elements of, the, of nuclear stalemate, the Cold War makes a lot more sense, the post-Cold War nuclear competition that you make makes a lot more sense, and it teaches important lessons about deterrence. So what are those three aspects of stalemate? Number one, stalemate is a wonderful thing once you build a survivable retaliatory force, but simply building a bomb or two doesn't get you there. So point number one is getting into stalemate is hard work. It's not simple. It takes a, a more than a few bombs in the basement. It especially is hard work if you happen to be facing a nuclear rival who is technically sophisticated and, and, and motivated to keep you out of the position of having a secure retaliatory force. So number one, getting into stalemate is hard. Number two, stalemate is a two-way street. And this resonates directly with what Brendan was talking about. Namely, once you build a survivable force that can withstand your adversary's best strike and still retaliate, you're done for the moment, but you're not done for good. Because your adversary, if he's persistent, if he's technologically sophisticated, if he's good at his job, is going to find ways to whittle away your secure retaliatory force by finding vulnerabilities in your standard operating procedures or in your intelligence or in your NC3. And so even once you're in stalemate, you need to keep competing to keep the other side from pulling you out of stalemate or maybe you yourself escaping. And then number three is having a secure retaliatory force doesn't solve all your problems, not even all your most important problems. If, if you wish to use nuclear threats to deter some non-nuclear attacks, like major conventional attacks, Suddenly, you need nuclear weapons with a range of additional capabilities. They have to be usable in the context of a major conventional attack. They have to be flexible so you can use them in a geopolitical or military context, which might be changing rapidly as it would in a conventional war. You have to have resilient survivability, meaning not merely a survivable arsenal that's survivable in peacetime, or survivable in the first, after the first day of conventional war, but it has to still be survivable after you've suffered a week or two weeks or a month of conventional operations. And still you have to be able to use it if you're trying to use it in the conventional context while retaining its survivability so that it can deter follow on nuclear attacks by your enemy. So the point is what we argue in the book is that the solution for this big puzzle why do we on one hand have these weapons that are so good at deterring? And yet for the past 75 years, we've had a world in which countries are arms racing so much and competing so hard. Is the weapons to, do in fact deter really effectively, but it takes a lot to get into stalemate and it's a competitive process. It takes a lot to remain in stalemate and that too is a competitive process. And because many countries, though not all, have sought to use their nuclear capabilities to deter other things as well, which have required to build in additional nuclear capabilities that would be usable in those contexts. So that's the argument in the book. And we believe that if you understand those things, the arms race of the 1950s makes sense. The arms race of the 60s through 80s makes sense. You understand what's going on between the US and North Korea today on the Korean Peninsula. North Korea desperately trying to arms race into a survivable, deliverable force against the United States and the United States arms racing to prevent that from happening. You see the problems confronting Iran as they wrestle with the possibility of a nuclear arsenal and know who it is they would be facing, who would be trying to find, locate, and threaten that arsenal. It reveals an awful lot about the nuclear age while solving this puzzle. All right, that's the first half of what I'd like to say. The second half now builds on some of those ideas, but jumps to the present. And Ben asked me to make what perhaps in this audience is a controversial argument. Although I'll jump to the, to the finish line and say, I'm gonna make the case for US counterforce capabilities, for the United States to continue to build and hone counterforce capabilities. I'm gonna admit at the end, 
several of the reasons why doing so is also costly and dangerous and say it's a trade-off. But I will offer this entire second half of the argument, not so much to convince you that you should favor more counterforce capabilities than you currently do, but to explain the procurement choices that we've already made and continue to make. We've made throughout the Cold War, we made over the past 15 years, and I think we're continuing to make now. Okay, so first of all, what do I mean when I say counterforce? When I say counterforce, I'm including the nuclear capabilities, the conventional capabilities, the non-kinetic means of attack, missile defenses, ISR, command and control, all those things together which facilitate effective attacks on enemy nuclear forces. So not all conventional capabilities the United States build are counterforce in this sense. It's all of that basket of things which taken together have the effect of substantially increasing the possibility of effective U.S. attack on enemy nuclear forces. All right. Why might it be potentially very valuable for the United States to have excellent counterforce capabilities? There are four or five steps in this argument. So let me try to lay them out quickly. Step number one, the United States has allies all around the world and many of them face nuclear armed enemies. Step number two, if we find ourselves in a conventional war with a nuclear armed opponent, it could be tomorrow on the Korean Peninsula. It could be next week in the Strait, in the Taiwan Strait. In a decade, that war might be in the Strait of Hormuz facing a nuclear armed Iran. Or as we all know, after this past summer, it could be in the Baltics facing Russia. But if we find ourselves in a conventional war with a nuclear armed opponent, our adversary in many cases will have powerful and rational reasons to use nuclear weapons. And by use nuclear weapons, I mean either threaten the employment of nuclear weapons or actually employ them against us, against us and our allies. Why in the world would they have such an incentive? Well, as a means to stalemate us, stalemate our superior conventional capabilities, hold us at bay, prevent us from inflicting unacceptable conventional defeat on them. If you want to leap ahead and get the simplest shortcut to understand why that's potentially rational for an enemy, even one who has no hope of winning a nuclear war. It's because losing a conventional war to the United States is often a terrible, terrible outcome. Think about the fate of Saddam Hussein. Think about the fate of Muammar Gaddafi or Manuel Noriega, Losevic or Karadzic. In Washington, in defense contractors, among academics, we refer to these conflicts that the United States fights with some frequency as regional wars. To our enemies, in many cases, these are existential. And therefore, we should expect enemies faced with this risk to use any weapons in their arsenal to try to hold us back and keep us from pushing these wars to conclusion. All right, so that's number two. Number one, we have many allies around the world, many of which face nuclear armed adver adversaries. Number two, in a conventional war that they're losing over important stakes, nuclear armed adversaries have a rational incentive to use these weapons coercively to force us to stop, even if they have no hope of winning the nuclear war. Number three, perhaps you're wondering if that's a logical chain of reasoning, but one that doesn't really match onto the real world. Let me disabuse you of that and say that throughout the nuclear age, if you look at the nuclear armed countries who were conventionally weak with respect to their principal enemies, who expected to lose conventional wars over things they cared dearly about, every one of them except for one adopted this as a nuclear doctrine, as a nuclear strategy. This was NATO's nuclear doctrine for the period of the Cold War in which we were locked in stalemate. In the 1950s, when we thought we could win a nuclear war, our plan for waging World War III was winning the nuclear war. But from the 60s to the 80s, where we didn't expect we could win a nuclear war, our strategy to offset perceived Soviet conventional superiority was to escalate 
in a variety of different ways against a variety of different topics to coerce the Soviets to stop. That was our strategy while we were conventionally weak. It's Pakistan's strategy vis-a-vis -vis India. If they can't defend themselves against a major Indian invasion, they plan to use nuclear weapons coercively. It's North Korea's strategy, it appears, against overwhelming South Korean and U.S. conventional forces. I suspect it's their strategy against overwhelming Chinese forces as well. Russia has flirted with this strategy over and up, on and off for the past 15 years as they've talked about how to deal with overwhelming conventional forces in the West or in the East. The one exception has been China, who to this point, though they have been conventionally outmatched in their region, have not talked about using nuclear weapons in this fashion, though the Chinese nuclear arsenal and the Chinese nuclear doctrine is in flux. Let's see if they come in line with everyone else. Okay, lastly, why do counterforce capabilities in the hands of the United States, let's say, help with this problem? The problem being that in the midst of conventional wars, adversaries have an incentive to escalate. We have to understand why adversaries are escalating. Adversaries would be escalating if they see the course of the conventional war as being terrible for them, and especially if it's leading to serious threats to the regime survival. And in these circumstances, whether you're thinking about Russia and Ukraine or NATO in 1975 or Pakistan facing an overwhelming Indian conventional attack, the reasoning is if we, the weak side, use one or two or four nuclear weapons, preferably against battlefield targets, but, but who knows, that that will confront the stronger side with the reality that we're not going to let them beat us in conventional war. And that we, the weak side, are escalating to turn a losing conventional war into a competition in pain. Where we use a couple, they respond with a couple. We use a couple, they respond with a couple. And the trick here is that the side who's losing the conventional war, in most cases, has the advantage. Because they stand to lose much more. Typically, they have much more on the line. And therefore, one would expect them to take greater risks and suffer more pain in this back and forth interaction. So that's the problem. Why do counterforce capabilities help? Well, if North Korea is losing a war on the Korean Peninsula and is weighing the possibility of the leadership running off to China or escalating to try to stalemate the Combined Forces Command, if the United States doesn't have counterforce capabilities, Nuclear escalation by North Korea is a dangerous card to play, but it's one that's got a real chance of success. Sure, we might retaliate with two or three in response, but at the end of the day, if we can't protect ourselves or protect our allies, why would we get into a back and forth city exchange with North Korea rather than accept the ceasefire that they demand? Same thing with nuclear escalation in Ukraine. Same thing with Indian and Pakistani escalation. On the other hand, if the United States has a mix of conventional capabilities backed with some nuclear capabilities, missile defense, that allows us to respond to North Korean escalation by disabling the rest of their weapons or almost the rest of their weapons, that gives us an alternative response with two benefits. The first is hopefully North Korea losing the conventional war their leadership will, design, will, will decide to run off to China rather than escalate. And second, if they don't make that change, that choice, at least we have some capability to protect our allies and protect ourselves. So the overarching argument is in a world of extended deterrence, in a world in which the United States has allies who face enemies with nuclear weapons, we face situation after situation which is like the one that we posed for the Soviets in the Cold War. The only change is that the seats in the table have changed. No longer are we the weak trying to employ nuclear weapons coercively to hold back the strong. Now we're the conventionally strong trying to figure out how to deal with the rational and stalemating strategies of the conventional weak. All right, two last things and I'll be done. The first is, does building these capabilities have costs and entail trade-offs? Yes and yes. Obviously, in an age in which uh, nuclear modernization in any flavor is going to be very, very expensive, 
in which there are big demands on U.S. defense budgets. Um, building up counterforce capabilities is expensive. Perhaps more importantly, we should recognize that the more we build the conventional and nuclear and other capabilities to disarm anybody's nuclear arsenal, we energize rivals of the United States to build more. Build more nuclear weapons, to build, to build more diverse delivery capabilities, maybe to enhance their peacetime alert levels. All of these are costs and they're real costs. When I weigh those costs against the potential benefits of building counterforce capabilities for the purpose of doing better, protecting allies, protecting ourselves in wars today, like the Korean Peninsula, maybe the Taiwan Strait. The reason I come down, and I think perhaps you should as well, on the side of counterforce is because many of the things that we are doing, which are threatening adversary nuclear forces, we will do anyway, even if we abandon the intentional development of counterforce capabilities. I'm talking about missile defense, which we will do anyway because of the close inherent integration of missile defenses with conventional warfare in the missile age. We're going to be enhancing the accuracy of our conventional strike systems because that's how you fight modern conventional war. We're going to be enhancing our ISR capabilities against mobile targets because that's how you locate, find, and destroy enemy mobile targets, irrespective of whether they're conventional or nuclear. So as I weigh the costs and benefits of enhancing these capabilities versus the energizing impact they have on some countries' nuclear arsenals, one of the things that weighs heavily in my mind is how much our other efforts would appear to energize their nuclear forces, even if we didn't move this direction. All right, the last thing I'll say in conclusion is back to the very beginning, is the kinds of capabilities that I think fit into this portfolio, I'm not talking about fancy, expensive, major expansions of missile defense. I'm not talking about hypersonic this and hypersonic that, though that could play a role. What I'm talking about is all the systems that you have seen deployed over the past 10 or 15 years, and perhaps has made you scratch your head. Why has the United States been vastly improving the fuse on its ballistic missiles that has the key, that has the impact of greatly increasing their capability against hard targets? And in fact, allows them now to be used into press trajectories without reducing their effectiveness. Why in the world has the United States been um, improving its nuclear command and control to make our weapon systems much more flexible and easier to target. Why is the United States flirting with conventional Trident? Why did we increase the accuracy of the B-61 bomb? I won't say that this logic of counterforce has driven every single one of those decisions. Some of that might just be explained by the logic that Brendan laid out, which is we also are seeing if we can escape, escape mad at least in some diets. But this problem of extended deterrence and wartime escalation is one major driver, and it's probably the one that I think is the most logical for the pursuit of these weapons. All right, let me stop there so we can take lots of questions and have, um, have a good discussion. Um, so with that, I'll just turn it back over to you, Ben. Great, thanks so much, Daryl. Great talk, uh, so much to think about here. Uh, I'm hoping we, <clears throat> everybody in the uh, attendee list will start raising their hands. We already have a couple questions in the queue. Um, I quickly want to ask, I'll take the, the host prerogative and ask a quick first question. Um, you know, I think here at the laboratory and I think in, in general, uh, in the security environment, we're seeing a lot of headwinds for future arms control. And what I'm wondering is with your research, uh, you know, uh, in the back of your mind, do you, do either of you see any, uh, any, any brighter prospects for arms control or any possibilities for arms control um, in the current security environment? Brendan, do you want to go first? Well, I, I suppose I would say that I don't see anything on the horizon, um, but I think there's, uh, you know, there's always a kind of, you know, broad sunlit upland for arms control in the future although not for the reason why most advocates of arms control think, uh, which is that in the Cold War, our arms control was a very potent force for, for two things that decision makers really wanted. 
which is one, um, they wanted to make defense policy uh, without uh, like their general public uh, and Congress getting in the way too much. Uh, and arms control was a major way that they were able 